Hi everyone, I'm Adrienne and I'm an engineer on the Chrome team. And I'm April, I work at Mozilla, the people who make Firefox. And today we're going to be talking about measuring HTTPS adoption on the web. For most of the internet's history, web traffic was unencrypted, meaning your traffic went over HTTP without either SSL or TLS. This meant that anyone on the network in line in that connection between the client and the server was able to modify or see that content in transit. Over the last few years, though, that's been changing. HTTPS has become more and more common, and there's been a huge, big community push behind this change. Let's Encrypt, for example, has made setting up certificates easy and cheap. Browsers have made it so that HTTP is less and less desirable by restricting which APIs are available to HTTP, and also by changing the UI to tell people that, hey, your private information is not private over this HTTP website. Now, April and I both uh, care a lot about HTTPS. It's near and dear to our hearts. Uh, we've been part of this larger community effort trying to shift the web towards HTTPS. So the first question we have was, are the community's efforts paying off? Is HTTPS becoming mainstream? You know, is all of this working? And let's say the answer is yes. Is there still more work to do? Can we all you know, just go home and be like, yeah, job well done? Or do we still have to do things? And if so, where should we target those efforts? And second, we both work for, friends. We, we both work for browser vendors. Browsers want to treat HTTPS as the default. What I mean by that is when you type in www.example.com, currently the browser has to go to HTTP first before then being re redirected to HTTPS. Ideally, I'd like to live in a world where when a user types in www.example.com, we just go to HTTPS because the browser can know that the HTTPS uh, version of the site will work. And so we want to know how far away is that future. In order to get answers to these questions, we measured how much of the web is HTTPS in 2017 and also took a look back in time at how HTTPS adoption has been trending over the last few years. Now, I have to admit, I was originally a little naive about this. I thought, okay, we'll get one, maybe two numbers that'll, you know, two statistics that'll tell us the answer to this question. But it actually turned out to be a bit more complex than I originally anticipated. One of the reasons why this is a nuanced answer is because there's many different perspectives through which you can look at HTTPS usage and adoption. Client, server, and network. From the client perspective, that's the browser, it's how much, what is the user experience? How much of the user's web browsing happens over HTTPS? Then there's a server perspective. That's how many web servers support HTTPS. And third, there's a network perspective, looking at uh, bytes or packets on the network, how much of that is happening over HTTP and HTTPS. And you can actually get pretty different answers to this question depending on which of the three perspectives you look at. I'm going to talk about the client perspective, and then April is going to talk about the server and network perspectives. Our goal here was to measure the user experience of HTTPS to get, uh, and that's why we're looking on the client side. And we use browser telemetry to do that. Browser telemetry is something that's supported by both Chrome and Firefox, and it allows us to get aggregate course, um, large-scale metrics from users who have opted in that tell us basic things like what percentage of page loads are HTTP versus HTTPS. Now, it's not quite as simple as just, okay, you know, what percent of web browsing is HTTP or HTTPS, because this is a uh, subjective experience, and we want a quantitative percentage-based answer. There are a few different ways that we can measure this from the browser. The first is to uh, look at page loads. Um, so just of all the pages loaded in the browser, that are successfully committed, what percentage of those are HTTPS? And this is a nice, simple metric. This is pretty much how browsers measure most things. You know, if we were going to deprecate an API, for example, this is what we would look at. What percentage of page loads use that API? But this actually gets a little bit tricky because of something called an in-page navigation. You may have seen this before without even realizing it. Uh, a very popular uh, web development pattern is that instead of actually having the user 
say, click on a link to view a message that someone sent them, it'll fake that browser navigation, meaning instead of actually transitioning to a whole new page, um, the page JavaScript will dynamically fetch the content, swap out the content you're looking at on the page, and maybe even use an API to change what's in the path and in the history to make it look like a navigation occurred. But from the browser's perspective, a navigation didn't actually occur. In order to try to capture this, in Chrome we implemented something called the extended page load metric, which also includes these in-page navigations because people perceive them as navigations. The tricky thing here is you could also argue, though, that this overcounts how much time people spend on top pages because you know, Gmail is, is in-page navigation happy. It does in-page navigations all the time. So maybe this overcounts top sites. Regardless, though, whether, of which, whether you count in-page navigations or not, all of these page load-based metrics have a bit of a problem, and that's related to tabbed browsing. Let me go through an example to explain why tabbed browsing matters so much in this context. All right, so there's Alice and Bob, and they have a cat, Mallory. And uh, they do a Google search, uh, why doesn't my cat love me anymore? Alice uses tabs, and Bob doesn't. And you're going to see that this is going to really affect how much HTTPS it looks like they're each using. Alice uses tabs. She's going to click on the first nine search results and open them each in tabs. Each of those tabs will load an HTTP web page. Alice has now had a 10% HTTPS usage rate because the search result page was HTTPS, and then the subsequent nine page loads and tabs were HTTP. Bob, on the other hand, doesn't really use tabs. He's not much of a computer user. He opens a search result page, then goes to the first search result, then goes back to the result page, then goes to the next page, so on and so forth. From his perspective, 50% of the pages that he loaded were over HTTP and 50% over HTTPS. They saw the same pages in the same order, but ended up with different rates at which it looks like they use HTTPS. To try to work around this and get it maybe a, a better sense of the user experience, in Chrome we also implemented the time and foreground metric, which measures, which measures how much time is spent on tabs in the foreground over HTTPS, trying to avoid the complexities of what types of navigations to count and what types of navigations to not count. Now, in addition to those nuances over page load, navigations, etc., we find that HTTPS usage also varies by other properties. Who the user is, what types of websites do they go to, what country are they in, what platform are they on. For this reason, we like to always split our metrics by platform and then also by country whenever possible. All right, now those of you who zoned out while I was nerding out about metrics, come back, um, and we're going to talk about results. I'm going to start off with the good news about what we found, which is that regardless of which metric we look at, globally, more than half of web browsing is HTTPS. This is awesome. This was not the case a year or two ago. This is great. This shows that you know, for most people, most of their web browsing is over HTTPS now. And you see this in both Chrome across the three different metrics and also in Firefox. And we can see that HTTP usage is trending upwards over time and it hasn't plateaued yet. This shows you in Chrome and you can see that the, the trend is pretty good. And we see the same thing also in Firefox. But that's not to say that our work is done. There are still areas where HTTPS support or usage is not as strong as we'd like yet. First of all, you may notice that Android lags behind other platforms in Chrome. Android is the blue bar here that is lower than all the other bars, which makes me sad. Chrome OS is the highest. Um, my theory for this is that Chrome OS users rely heavily on Google services, most of which are over HTTPS. On the other hand, on Android, people use a lot of apps. And what that means is that when people are going to Gmail, to do a Google search, to go to Facebook, they're using the app instead of opening it up in Chrome on in the, instead of opening up in the browser. Now, since as April will talk about in a little bit, the top sites like Google are much more likely to be HTTPS. So what this means is that in Android we're seeing a lot of long tail traffic that's less likely to be HTTPS. So if we want to move Android, we have to get to the long tail. 
We also see that some countries use HTTPS at lower rates than others. What this map is showing is the rate of HTTPS usage in Firefox, where darker countries uh, have, more H have higher HTTPS rates. You'll notice that, for example, uh, Iran and China have fairly low HTTPS usage rates, whereas some other countries, including the US, have much higher rates. I'd also like to talk about East Asia in particular for a minute. What this graph shows is that Japan has much lower HTTPS usage rates than other similar countries. And that this isn't just you know, something that happened in one, one moment. This is a trend that's happening over time, where other countries are increasing faster or started out higher than Japan. This, this graph doesn't show up, but the same is also true for Korea. I don't know exactly why I have a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that a lot of the outreach materials relating to HTTPS are in English. Now, when you go talk to developers in India, for example, many or even most of them speak English. The same for, say, Mexico. There's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of cross discussion between those developer communities. But it's my sense that there isn't as much discussion happening between Japanese developers and Korean developers and the American developers who are building out English documentation, English pitches for HTTPS, et cetera. I think that if we want to improve this, there needs to be more, more discussion between the different tech communities. Um, you do see that there's a sudden uptick in this earlier this spring in uh, J Japanese usage. Some colleagues of mine flew out, talked to a few Japanese websites that had HTTPS support, and asked them to turn it on by default, and they did. And there was an immediate uptick in how much usage there is of HTTPS in Japan. So I think the community needs more of that, more of that type of outreach. So as we've seen, HTTPS usage is rising regardless of how you measure it, which is awesome. I'm really excited about it. But there's still work left to do, particularly in the long tail, which April is now going to talk about. All right. Thank you, Adrian. So as she said, there are many ways that you can slice the browser telemetry data. You can look at page loads, extended page loads, in-page navigations, time on a web page. But no matter how you look at it, these stats are biased. And they are biased because they are weighted towards popular websites. And that makes sense. I mean, most people spend most of their time on the same popular websites, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters of the world. They spend a lot of their time on the web on these few sites. And so accordingly, the stats for the browsers look very high because these sites are all HTTPS by default. But we wanted to look at things from the server perspective. We wanted to go out and connect to a bunch of different servers and just a bunch of different websites and say, hey, do you work over HTTPS? Now, to be clear, you can, you can construct your list of websites that you use in a way that looks very similar to what people on browsers are seeing. For example, you can use the Google Top 100 Site List, which was generated by the Googlebot Search Indexer about a year ago. And you can go out to all of those websites and say, hey, do you work over HTTPS? And what you'll find is that 69% of them do. Similarly, you can use the Alexa Top 1 Million List, slice it down to just the Top 100 websites, and use the Mozilla Observatory to see if those sites support HTTPS. And when you do that, you find that 88% of them support HTTPS by default. Now, you might notice that these numbers are quite a bit different. And the reason why they're quite a bit different is that the Alexa list includes a lot of Google properties uh, and various country codes that the Google list does not include. So these popular sites support HTTPS very well. And over the last few years, they have done an incredible push to move towards HTTPS. Now, when we looked at this data about a year and a half ago, about 40% of the sites on the Googlebot list supported HTTPS, and about a little less than a quarter of them supported it as their default protocol. And in just the short year and a half, the numbers of the percentage of sites that support HTTPS has almost doubled from about 40% to about 70%. And the number of sites that support it by default has gone from a little less than a quarter to about 60%. That is fantastic news because people spent a lot of time on these websites. But these websites 
you know, they're a little bit anomalous, right? I mean, they have large support staffs of people who understand information security. A lot of them are in this room. They know how to set up a website with HTTPS. They know how to get digital certificates. And they know how to deploy it. But these websites are not the entirety of the web. See, there's a lot more to the web than just these popular websites. You know, now when you ask somebody like to name a website, they're going to name these popular websites. But there's a very, very long tail of websites that are nevertheless very important to people's experiences on the web. For example, I'm talking about your local restaurant's website, where you need to go and look up their hours and their menu. I'm talking about, you know, people's favorite web comics, where you might go a few times, uh, you might log in a few times a week to look at, uh, you know, your favorite comic. I'm also talking about people's personal blogs, where they share the latest news in cat-based cosplay. These sites are very important to people. They matter a lot. Without them, the web would not be the same place. But yet, they don't show up in statistics nearly as much. Now, there are ways that you can include them in statistics. Now, the way that is most commonly used, especially in a lot of research papers, is the Alexa Top 1 Million list. This is a list put out by Amazon every day. And it is generated by people who install what is called the Alexa toolbar into their web browser. And this toolbar keeps track of the sites that people have visited over the course of the day and sends them up to Amazon. And from that, they produce a rough list of based uh, a rough list that is roughly analogous to the popularity of these websites. Now, of course, it's not perfect. Like, you know, you can't look at site 900,000 and say, this is definitely more popular than site 900,001. But nevertheless, it is reasonably representative of the long tail of the web. And when we took these sites and put them into the Mozilla Observatory, these top 1 million websites, what we found is about 46% of them support HTTPS by default. This is a lot less than the top 100 we saw on the previous slide. Now, another way you can look at the long tail is you can just take every single IPv4 address and you can connect out to all 4.2 billion-ish of these addresses and see if they have a web server running on them on port 80. And if they do, also connect to them on port 443 and see if there's a web server listening there. Now, I suspect there's a whole lot of Apache and Nginx pages that say, hey, congratulations, you set up a website. Um, because when you look at these numbers, there's a huge difference. Only 10% of, of servers that have websites running on them have HTTPS available. Now, you might be wondering, as you go down the long tail, does HTTPS support decrease? And the answer for that is that it definitely does. When you look at the top 100 websites, as we showed in the previous slide, 88% of them supported HTTPS. And even as you go to the top 1,000 websites, you know, you still have a very respectable three quarters of websites supporting HTTPS. But this continues to decline. If you look at the top 10,000, it's only 66%. As you look at the top 100,000, 56%. As you look at the top million, only 46%. There's a fairly linear decline as you go down the list of sites on the Alexa Top 1 Million list. And this makes a sort of sense, right? I mean, a lot of these websites, especially towards the end, they're run by a single person. They may or may not know how to set up HTTPS, unlike the more popular sites that have bigger staffs and, more, and bigger staffs, more knowledge about how to do this sort of stuff. But despite the fact that we see only 46% in the Top 1 Million, the news is actually pretty good. See. This long tail support for HTTPS has been steadily increasing over time. When we first scanned the top 1 million list with Mozilla Observatory back in April of 2016, what we found was that only about 30% of these top 1 million websites supported HTTPS. And depending on how you, how you analyzed it, only 5 to 10% of them supported it by default. But in just a short year and a half, thanks to an outrageous and amazing community effort, that number has increased from 30% to about 45% of having HTTPS available, and about 15 to 25% of it being available by default. This is a huge, huge number of websites that have had added support for HTTPS in a very short amount of time. We should be pretty proud. But nevertheless, we need to get this number, this 46%, up to that same percentage that you see for the more popular websites.
Now, looking at a server list is certainly very interesting, and as it is looking at a client list. Both of these have very different data. It is nevertheless very interesting, but there's another way you can slice this data. You can look at it from a network perspective. Now, the Maui project is run by an organization in Japan called WIDE, and WIDE runs one of the major internet backbones in Japan. And for years, they have been sharing aggregate statistics on the traffic that passes over their network, both from a byte perspective and from a packet perspective. So they might say, you know, we have seen this many HTTP packets and bytes, you know, on this given day, and we've seen this many packets and bytes that are HTTPS. And from that, you can generate a ratio of HTTP to HTTPS. And when they first started releasing their data, or when we first started looking at it at least, back in January of 2014, what we found was that only about 15% of web traffic over their network was done over HTTPS. And since then, in the intervening few years, that percentage has increased steadily up to 35%. Now, that's pretty great, but it's still lower than the Alexa Top 1 million scans. It's much lower than the browser data shows as well. I have a few hypotheses for this. Uh, one is that, as Adrian said, in Japan, historically, there's been lower support for HTTPS, so that is certainly affecting these statistics. But also, you know, I think there might be a lot of, um, you know, I think a lot of data that is bulk data is delivered over HTTP because many service providers make it cheaper to deliver that data over HTTP. I'm talking things like videos, things like audio files, things like large executables, where you know, for small companies, saving a percentage of their uh, transit costs for delivering over HTTP is pretty significant. So anyways, no matter how you slice this data, whether you look at it from a client perspective, or a server perspective, or a network perspective, you get very different answers. So Adrian is gonna go and uh, talk about some of the takeaways from that. I was frankly surprised when, when we looked at this to find out how much HTTPS adoption and usage rates depended on your vantage point, both in terms of the client network server split, but also in terms of who we're looking at, and, you know, the types of websites someone visits, the platform they're on, the country they're in. And I think it's really important that we're, we're clear on that. And when people are citing statistics for presentations, news articles, citations in papers, it's important to make sure that the statistic, the metric you're citing, is the appropriate one for what you're looking at. Um, this matters to, uh, for us day to day as we're trying to figure out things like um, when can we make this change in a browser, et cetera. But it, it, I think it's important in many areas. Uh, we put some guidelines in our paper, which I encourage people to check out, to talk about when to use which type of metric in which scenario. Now the, see, people are cheering. <laughs> so the good news is that we have seen a tremendous growth in the use of HTTPS across the web, no matter how you look at the data. The outreach efforts in this area have been outstanding. Whether we're talking certificate authorities like Let's Encrypt, which offer free digital certificates to anyone, whether we're talking large hosting companies that have moved all of their users' websites to HTTPS by default for free, whether we're talking tools and tooling that make setting up websites with HTTPS super easy, or even just people every day going on and documenting how they set up their website and how they use these tools in good, clear, easy to understand documentation. All of these community efforts have made a huge impact on the use of HTTPS over the last few years. But nevertheless, significant work remains to move the long tail of the web to HTTPS. I really want to see that Alexa Top 1 million look like the Alexa Top 100. Because when we get to that point, browsers can start doing HTTPS by default. You know, we need to do this so that we can get those Android numbers up. We need to do this so we can get those you know, East Asian numbers up. Once we do that, we can move to a web where HTTPS is presumed to be the default protocol. Thanks, everyone. The Farshad Abbasi, I'm with Besides Vancouver. Quick question for you. Um, in your, just out of curiosity, in your measurements, both the client and the server, did you include uh, sites where the content's static, or pages where there's static content, or was the focus on uh, you know, pages or sites where there's user data as exchange involving a login or authenticated session? 
Uh, we don't differentiate based on website content. Right, because I would imagine static content doesn't really need HTTPS, so that's probably why a majority of those those, uh, uh, those particular... I would, I would uh, take issue with that. Um, so I think that, uh, first of all, it's difficult to make that judgment call, right? Because it depends on what the static content is. Well, it's like my personal, you know, here's about, far, you know, typical, here's a picture, here's some text or whatever. If there's no user login where there's no exchange of user information, then... I mean, it, it depends, you know. Uh, it depends on what you're looking up. Um, it depends on who you are. It's very difficult for you, someone as a website owner to know what types of privacy guarantees the person looking at their content is going to need. Well, the sushi restaurant was a good example, right? If it's just sushi menu and phone number, why is there a need for uh, HTTPS there? So, so uh, I Okay. I will add really quickly from a server perspective, we just connect, we don't log in or anything like that. But nevertheless, it's super important for any sites that even people think are not important or less important to still support HTTPS. Once they do that, if people connect to those websites, they can inadvertently be part of a botnet, which has happened in the past. They can have advertising injected in them, which has definitely happened and frequently happens on the internet. It's just as important for those sites to support HTTPS as it is for sites like Google. It also prevents browsers from switching to HTTPS as default. So, you know, like the, a few sites that think, oh, hey, we're not important, is preventing us from do, taking action for the rest of the web. Hi, Nick Sullivan, Cloudflare. Uh, one metric that I, I think is pretty interesting is just raw number of HTTP requests. Do you have the numbers for how many HTTP requests are over the scheme HTTP versus HTTPS? Uh, we have uh, transactions in, like, network transactions as, as one measure of it yes. in the paper. Okay. Yes. As far as, like, the browser telemetry goes, like, any given data set for Firefox would include billions and billions of telemetry notes. So it's a lot of Hi. Uh, Martin Artson, NCSCNL. Um, so your uh, points about the long tail make me think about, like, the local bakery or your, your blog about uh, cats that uh, look like Pikachu. Um, so is one million websites the long tail? And is, is an IPv4 scan the long tail? Because it seems that those like random <coughs> shops on, on, uh, on your corner are probably using shared hosting. And then you will only get their shirts if you use SNI. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how we can do better in that area to, to actually look at those small websites that may not be in the top million and may not be, uh, don't have their own IP? Uh, v4 addresses to serve their content? So I would say that like the, the best way to help move these websites, because again, most of these are not run by technically, no. technically advanced mostly, people. Yeah. Uh, the, the real focus, I think, should be on hosting providers. Yeah. You know, Let's Encrypt makes it super easy for those hosting providers to get certs for every single one of those websites that they host. Uh, and a lot of the really, really big ones over the last year have moved to HTTPS, yeah. which is the only reason why you can see that number has gone up which is a big reason why that number has gone up so much, but there's still a lot and a lot and a lot of smaller hosting providers, and we really need to target those. Once we target those, I think we'll pick up a lot of that long tail. Yeah, thoughts on how to measure that? It's all about human contact. Like, so much of my job is just going out to people and being like, hey, could you do this thing to make the internet safer? And most of the time when you do that, they're like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. I'm totally going to do that. So most people want to do this. They just need to be. They just need to be poked to do it. I also have an intern here, Ariana, who can wave her hand, who's looking into that question right now. If you want to talk to her later. <laughs> Thanks for your awesome work. Hi, Kevin Kane, Microsoft Research. Does the definition <clears throat> you used of supports HTTPS just mean that it could negotiate any kind of connection, or did you distinguish based on whether or not the certificate presented changed up to something in the trusted root store as opposed to being self-signed, particularly for sites uh, in the long tail? That's a really good question. Um, we weren't able to dive into this that much in the presentation. Different um, sort of lists and tools for measuring measure different ways. Like the Google Transparency Report, Top 100, measures slightly different than the Mozilla Observatory. Um, we have a full discussion in the paper. Um, but uh, quickly, um, like the census data, for example, can't check whether the, uh, co the common name is the right name, for example, because it's just hitting an IP address. Mozilla. The, Mozilla Observatory don't, the Mozilla Observatory does, in fact, require a valid certificate to be considered as supporting HTTPS. That does chain up to a, a valid uh, root certificate authority. Do you have any gut feeling at all for what the proportion is between the two groups? How many have real search versus self-signed? Do you have any intuition? Uh, I could look at the data, but we, there's nothing, I think, in the paper. Um, there's a pretty significant percentage of sites that 
have something that listens on port four four three, but it's not for that website but i think that's just because you have shared hosts where a bunch of websites are http and then some small number of those same websites are https all right like cool thank you let's thank the speakers again we're out of time